All right, so next we have Dr. Mandy Feldman and Nosa Cruz, two rheumatology experts that are very passionate about this. And, and Nosa was also the Healthcare Advocate of the Year last year. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. We're going to tag team up here. Um, so I'm a rheumatologist in private practice in New Orleans, and uh, Marty, I wish I could be up here talking about the things that Marty talked about, because I do talk about that with my patients. And although I'm not direct primary care, I do book every new patient for an hour and every revisit at least a half hour. It's the only way you can actually practice medicine, in my, in my opinion. But we're happy to be here. You're going to hear a little bit of an audio. And um, I am fairly active on LinkedIn, and a, uh, an employer consultant uh, sent this to me anonymously. I knew her name, but she asked me to keep her anonymous because she, she, she works for, she, she interacts with a number of insurance companies, but she thought this might be interesting for me to hear. And this was four years ago. It explains, she's discussing with a pharmacy tech from OptumRx. She worked for her employer, and one of the employees had metastatic prostate cancer. Went to the drugstore to pick up his generic uh, cancer drug, and they said, I'm sorry, we only cover the brand, which was at that time $10,000, and the generic was three fifty. dollars So this is her conversation with the pharmacy tech to kind of understand why. I'm, I'm a pharmacy technician from prior authorization department. Okay. Uh, uh, Zytega, which is uh, uh, the uh, a chemo agent, mm -hmm. the brand is uh, a tier two with prior off required. The generic of that product states a plan benefit exclusion with no prior authorization. Employer had no idea. Does that mean that the generic is, is a complete out of pocket? Yes. Unless they do, uh, they may request an appeal for it. And uh -huh. if it's added to the, if, if it's approved, it will be covered at the highest tier available for the members' pharmacy benefits. I'm going to stop it there. There's a little bit more to it, but ultimately the patient would pay a lot more for the $350 drug than for the $10,000 drug. And this was three or four years ago. I had already been on the PBM uh, roadshow probably since 2015. But let's get on. I'm the uh, media past president of CSRO. We are, the, I think, the premier advocacy group for rheumatologists in the country. Um, and uh, I was, we, were, we were given a grant to put together an employer toolkit, so I put this slide deck together, and there's a portion of it that talks about specialty pharmacy ripoffs and mandated white bagging. Don't throw tomatoes at me about white bagging, because mandated white bagging can put you into some hot water if you're a self-insured employer. And I'm, I, I, Nilsa is from this area, so I'd love, I brought Nilsa in to, to give that part of the talk. Okay, so the issues basically that we're dealing with, you have employees and what they want is access to choice, proper health care, affordable health care, and as an employer, of course you want to take care of your employees, but you also have to make it affordable or else the whole, the whole house of cards falls apart. So, There we go. So your health insurance purchasing decisions, which is you know, basically what everyone's been talking about here, directly impact your employee's access to care, but just as importantly, it affects your access to value. And if some of those decisions are either knowingly or unknowingly not made correctly, it could get you into some fiduciary duty. And I know Julie Selesnick yesterday was talking about this. And we've spent a lot of time on this now with rheumatologists actually educating them about the fiduciary duty of employers in terms of getting the right drug for the right patient at the right time to avoid some of those long-term problems. If you don't get the right drug for a rheumatoid arthritis patient and they have to go on prednisone, what happens? They become diabetic, they get infections, they end up septic in the ICU. And that ends up costing a lot more. So working together to make sure that those long-term um, unintended consequences of not getting the right drug don't happen to your employees. Because even the non-monetary, you know, absenteeism, the, the, the ability of the, the patient to be even happy at work, all of those things make your business better. 
So yes, I treat immunologic and inflammatory diseases, and um, the drugs are very expensive. And in fact, it's, it's too long of a story to tell you how I got into this sort of PBM business, but it had to do with a drug coming to market and uh, pricing itself the same as Humira in spite of the fact that it was a pill. And they were told we had to do it. The drug rep came into the office and I said, I'm not gonna prescribe that. It's the same as Humira. And back then, Humira was only $2,000 a month. And uh, as it turns out, if they didn't price it higher, and you're gonna see how this works, they couldn't get on the formulary. So for self-insured employers, the specialty drugs really end up being the biggest expense. And in spite of the fact that maybe only one or perhaps two of your employees have these diseases, they uh, drive at least 40 to 50% of your drug spend. And um, so in the long run, if there's a way that you can somehow Education and transparency are going to be the key. And I know someone said transparency may end up with price fixing. But there, there's good transparency and perhaps maybe there's bad transparency. But there are some things that you need to know about drugs that perhaps cost less that perhaps a conflicted consultant may not want to tell you about. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those as well. Um, the, a lot of the things that we're, we're going to be talking about today is what leads to employers spending maybe 30, maybe even 40% more than they need to on the pharmacy benefits. And there are some things that you can do and some education perhaps, whether it's you know, the CEO of your company or the benefits person um, that you know, maybe even we at CSRO can help you with, particularly with the rheumatologic drugs. So what are the different ways that employers are losing money? Well, formulary construction. And maybe many of you already know this, and I might be telling you something that you don't know, I mean, that you already know, but I'm gonna go through a little bit about how formulary construction can cost you a lot of money. And then the money hidden from the employer by traditional third-party administrators. So many of the non-transparent price concessions that the, I'm talking predominantly about the big three and some of their, you know, cousins, um, the money that they make from the manufacturer that you will never find out about. Um, those contracts are proprietary. And the only reason we have some of those numbers here is when the manufacturer sues the PBM, PBM countersues the manufacturer, and through discovery, we get some of those numbers. Specialty pharmacy ripoffs. This is one of my favorite topics. And I've, I'm letting Nilsa tell these stories, but I love telling them too. I, I might insert one of the good stories in, in terms of specialty pharmacy ripoffs. Lack of knowledge. No, and I, you know, we don't expect you to know how to treat a patient with rheumatoid arthritis or a patient with lupus. But there are some, um, I guess, some ways that you can at least have your benefit person be a little bit educated on. And I'm going to give you an example of three drugs. A couple of them were mentioned earlier today um, out to, you know, that treat rheumatoid arthritis. And one of them is in the 20,000s, one of them is in the 60,000s, and one of them is in the 80,000s. And guess which one never makes it to the formulary. And you will never hear of it. In fact, many rheumatologists, they, they know of the drug, but it's never been on the formulary because the price is too low. Trusting your con, uh, conflicted consultants, I'm gonna finish with that. Um, they can get you in hot water. I'm assuming everyone here is not conflicted, um, so this probably doesn't um, pertain to you. This is just a, a, an example. and, and and obviously, the uh, employer consultant that spoke with the OptumRx person, this was four or five years ago before Cost Plus Drugs, before Mark Cuban came out. Now there are other community pharmacists that offer um, you know, low prices like this. But this is, I mean, I think the, and I think Nils is going to have a slide, imatinib has become sort of the poster child of something you can get on Cost Plus Drugs for 30000 and yet 90000 through traditional PBMs. It's, um, you know, it's highway robbery. And I think this type of transparency is extremely important. You know, you would think that it would shame a company knowing that you can get a drug for $30 and yet you're charging six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000. But there is no shame among the health insurance companies. And I'm sure 
Mr. Potter will attest to that. Okay, so let's start with formulary construction. Um, we all know who constructs the formulary. I mean, of course, the pharmacy benefit managers say the employer constructs the, the formulary, but it's with the guidance of a broker who is often beholding to the pharmacy benefit manager. And I'd like to think that they're based on efficacy and safety, but believe me, it isn't. Um, perhaps it's based on the lowest price. No, not, not that either. It's actually based on the profitability and all the step therapy non-medical switching and exclusions that we see are switching patients, sometimes they're whipsawed back and forth six times a year to the most profitable drug for the PBM. Not necessarily for the employer, but for the PBM. And now, now we imagine going to the drug store and, and NOSA will show you a, a, a plan document where the patient nor the physician have to even be notified that, that the formulary has changed nor do they have to be notified that the drug is more expensive than the last drug. I give my husband's a, a active in Rotary, and so I've given this talk for employers at various Rotary clubs, and I had an employer come up to me afterwards. I signed the contract. I have AFib. I had no idea that I was knocking my own drug off the formulary. I went into AFib, had to get cardioverted, and now I'm spending twice as much on medicine. And this was the employer. So I can tell you there's a lot what you don't know can come back to bite you. So break down the money services. I hate putting this slide up, but I put it up for, I teach medical students as well and fellows, and, um, but it's usually in this aspect. And it starts looking like an immunology slide. But this is the contract between the manufacturer and the PBM. This is the contract that you don't have any access to. This is the contract where the money happens, where the real money happens. And to get place, placement on the formulary, um, they offer it to the manufacturer, and in response, they get rebate, rebates and fees. And you know, it's like Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. All we hear about is rebates, rebates, rebates. Rebates aren't so important anymore. I'm gonna show you how the fees that are hidden, and, and specifically in their contract with the manufacturers, that are never passed back to their client. And we can call them kickbacks, they wouldn't need safe harbor from the anti-kickback statute if they weren't kickbacks. I used to feel terrible when I'd write about it and put it, my son's an attorney, and he basically told me that. He said, no, they wouldn't need that safe harbor if they, if they weren't kickbacks. So you can call them that and not feel bad. This is the latest, specialty pharmacies. And yes, it has to do with white bagging. Now that they're all vertically integrated with the health, the medical side, and the pharmacy side, and the specialty pharmacy, they make a lot of money on specialty pharmacies. And it doesn't always save you money to white bag. And we have a couple of really good examples of that. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold. COVID tested three times, negative. Um, so it's sort of like an auction. The manufacturers go, and let me tell you, the competition to get on the formulary, if you've got an expensive drug and you're not covered on the formulary, alternative funders aside, no one is going to take your drug. So the competition to get on the formulary is fierce. And basically, the formulary rebate bid is, is pretty simple. You have a drug that's $2,000 a month. Manufacturer tells the PBM, I'll give you back 50% every script that's filled. Uh, OK, that's fine. I'll get 1,000 every month. And then the next manufacturer says, mine's 4,000 a month. It works the same. I'll give you 50% back. These are made up numbers, but the concept is there for every script that's filled. So one, the PBM gets 1,000, the other one, it gets 2,000. Which one are they gonna pick for the, it's very simple. Um, and as we learned in algebra, any increase in any one of these variables basically increases the chance that your drug is gonna get onto the formulary. Well, now that everyone's heard about rebates, many, many rebates are now reclassified as fees. And guess what? The fees are often a percent of the list price as well, which is why in Congress, both federally and in the state, they're, they're trying to pass laws where it's a flat base market fee. You shouldn't get paid more to procure a $10,000 drug than a $300 drug. Specialty pharmacy aside, but then many drugs are called specialty when they're not really special. 
So what about competition? I actually spoke, I speak before various state legislators and educate them on PBM when they're passing PBM reform. And as you know, the state laws don't affect the self-insured employers for the most part. Um, so I, this doesn't necessarily interfere with what you're doing. But one of the legislators said, well, wait, competition always lowers prices. This, and you know, and I, I give this example. So you're building a house, and the quality of the contractors are all the same. You know, no one is your friend's cousin's brother-in-law. And so consequently, in this situation, the contractors tend to put in their lowest bid, and you're going to pick the lowest one if the quality is all the same, and none of them are your friends. So the winner is the lowest bidder. But think of it when you're selling your house, and I'm sure all of you know this. You know, that someone has that house on the block that everybody wants, and so one day they put in, everybody puts in their lowest bid, no, their highest bid. And consequently, competition raises the price. It is unfortunate that our, dug, our drug distribution follows the paradigm of competition raising prices. So every time I hear we need more competition among the manufacturers to lower drug prices, that might happen if we were like Europe. Because in order to get on you know, the tender or the formulary in Europe, they bid on lowest price. Here we bid on essentially highest price. So I'm not saying, I'm not trying to let manufacturers off the hook, because when they come before our board, I've told them, I said, look, you guys point the finger at PBMs, they point the finger at you, get out of the rebate system. If that's an excuse why you're raising it, but none of them will do that. Oh, it's going to be collusion. The federal government will charge us for collusion. I say, well, they're not charging you to collude on rebates. So, you know, this is just creates a lot of smoke and mirrors. <clears throat> this was a contract of Express Script with a manufacturer. And Axios, if you know Axios, it's a media outlet. And they posted the Express Script contract up on their website. Probably, this may have been six, seven, eight years ago, and Express Scripts called them and said, um, that's an old contract, and so it's no longer good. We'd like you to take it down. And they said, well, if it's old, why should it, you know, why should it matter? And they said, well, you're going to take it down or we're going to sue you. But not until I got a screenshot of it. And um, basically, this just shows you everything that's not a rebate. And this was years ago. Administration fees, inflation payment, for procurement fees, care management, dispensing fees, bona fide, any other pharma revenue. And um, prohibitly, uh, we are prohibited, Express Scripts was prohibited from sharing any of these fees with any of their clients. Pharma revenue was interesting. I think it was 2017 when the SEC tried to get out of Express Scripts where their revenue came from. It took them a year to get that information from Express Scripts. And at the end of the year, it turned out 40% of Express Scripts revenue came from pharma. And they said, if 40% of your revenue comes from pharma, why, aren't, why don't you call pharma your clients? There's a lot of money that goes in from pharma to these PBMs. OK, complicated slide. And this is basically to show you uh, this, the reason why we have these Kaleo is a manufacturer that made a, a, a Narcan pen called Evzio. Their um, PBM was, Evz, uh, excuse me, was Express Scripts. And this was the formulary rebate they were supposed to be paying Express Scripts. This was the admin fee. This was the price protection rebate that went to Express Scripts. They raised their price here, and sure enough, the formulary rebate went up. Look what happened to the admin fee. And look what happened to the price protection fee. So at the end of the day, $26,000 in, in, in rebate, $8 million in total price concession. None of this will you see. Um, occasionally, you'll get an inflation fee in there. But the huge amount of price concessions that these PBMs are getting compared to the formula rebate, you can get 100% of the rebate, but you're still leaving a lot of money on the table. And that's where the lack of transparency, and it was only through discovery that we were even able to get this. So what has happened over the years in terms of the revenue for PBMs? 
So as you can see, I keep moving back and forth. Back in 2015, rebates were the, were the, hot, were the hot thing. Almost 30% came from um, rebates and about 15% from fees. This was the mandated mail order pharmacy and that made quite a bit. And this was their specialty pharmacy. Um, Nephron has, has come up with a, a one, I think, from 2022 or 2023. And sure enough, we see fees are now 30%. And the rebates have, are down to 7%. And guess what's now is the largest? Specialty pharmacy. Consequently, we have mandated white bagging, which sometimes will save you money, white bagging, but not always. And so that is part of the specialty pharmacy ripoff section of this talk. And I'm going to turn it over to Nilsa to give that. Take it away, Nilsa. <coughs> So let's talk a little bit about Dr. Maddie's favorite topic. It's also my topic because what you're about to see is an example at our rheumatology clinic next to St. Luke's Hospital. We're totally independent. And I am a national patient advocate. Three years ago, I got involved in this movement, thanks to Matt. And that's when I started reading plan documents and understanding more of what you guys do. And then I said, wait a minute, it's not United. Is not Cigna, is not Aetna, is no one but you paying my doctor's services. So uh, what do we have here? We all have heard about ERISA plans, and I'm not going to bother you with that, but I do want to remind you that they all fall under the jurisdiction of the Department of Labor, not under state jurisdiction, Something really important, as you know, these plans must act as fiduciary. They must look after the financial well-being of the employees and the plan itself, right? What happens if you knowingly or unknowingly breach that fiduciary duty. You can get sued. Prime example. And Johnson & Johnson was recently sued by an employee for breach of fiduciary duty. As you know, this is a bellwether case and should serve as a warning to employers who choose to trust their PBMs or just put their heads in the sand. I don't want to know, I don't want to know, I don't want to know. What are other ways of specialty pharmacy ripoffs? Well, you can have redefinitions of drugs as specialty. And if you all saw the Mark Cuban testimony, right? Um, what did he say? What is so special about them? It's the same medicine with a higher price. That's another way. You have generics that are actually costing an arm and a leg. You also have steering because there's so much integration here that you now have steering to their own specialty pharmacy, and then you have all of these fulfillments and fees that Dr. Maddie was talking about, which are literally making a whole lot of more money to mothership. So as a result of reclassifying generics as specialty drugs, we have the example, and that is imatinib, Mark Cuban has it for almost 35 bucks. Retail price at other pharmacies is a little over $9,600. Are you guys paying attention to this? So now let's talk a little bit about mandated white bagging. And I have to make a distinction here, guys. I can read minds. I do not oppose white bagging. But when I have this kind of mandated white bagging, it, became, it becomes problematic. And what is white bagging? That is when the PBM tells me that I am not allowed to 
buy and bill for the medication for Dr. Rosler to infuse or inject medications, as you know, are J codes. So if you hear that J codes, that's what we're talking about, expensive drugs. So I'm not allowed to buy and bill at the clinic. I have to obtain that via specialty pharmacy. And as Dr. Maddie previously explained, the reason for that is because there's a ton of money to be made through these vertically integrated PBMs that are literally mandated that my office obtains the medication through them. Here is a prime example, and this is one of my patients. So I love UPS. They actually deliver the medications that we infuse at our clinic. Very hardworking people, very honest, very fun to deal with. Uh, so United Postal Service, back in 2021, mandated white bagging uh, to my office. The cost to the employer was $43,408. The cost to the employee was $525. And how did I find that out? Well, there has been a lot of talk about overcharges of 30 to 40% by the PBMs to self-funded plans. And I needed, through my patient, who was in a really good position to obtain his receipt. This was a United Healthcare medical plan with CVS specialty carve out. So the patient had to fight a little bit to get that CVS receipt. And th those are the numbers. I mean, that was staggering. So I was able to convince um, UPS to allow me to do a buy and bill because I knew I could do it a whole lot cheaper for them. And in 2022, the cost to the employer through buy and bill at my office was $12,200. The cost to the employee was a mere $30. Amazing, right? So here I am thinking, why is in UPS with 500,000, 600,000 employees worldwide is able to see that this kind of ripoff rip is going on. Uh, again, uh, it was a savvy patient, and now here we're looking at, you know, the CAA of 2021, which I have been reading on. You know, it was, it was an area of concern for me because I didn't want to be part of ripping off this employer group. Uh, come to 2023, I'm thinking, well, I'm going to be getting an exception, which is what they gave me, they offer me, and they actually turned me down. I said, what? Do you really prefer to be paying 40 some thousand versus $12,000 for the same medication, same number of vials, same dose, same frequency? Please. That is when it was time to call the general here. Dr. Feldman at the CSRO. So they actually, she actually put a letter together very politely uh, with receipts on hand because now we had the CVS to UPS receipt and we have the Dr. Rosler Milwaukee Rheumatology slash NILSA receipt and Dr. Maddie's letter uh, with regards to mandated white bagging and that could be misconstrued as a breach of fiduciary duty, right? Higher cost to the employer, higher cost to the employee. So what happened on 2023 is that apparently CVS got wind of that letter that was sent to the leaders at UPS, Carol Tome, all the way down and within days, I was granted another exception. 2024 is not a slide, Dr. Maddie, but I want you to know that when it came back to this year, I was informed a well seat. And then I said, do you want me to call the general again? And do you need more receipts? Within 24 hours, I got my approval for 2024. 
I'm proud to say that, but what I'm not proud of is the fact that I have not been able to convince an employer group with 600,000 worldwide employees that this is only one patient example. I have no idea how many patients they have. The drug was Remicade, on Remicade, that are actually being mandated to white bagging. Physicians are not really looking into this and trying to be a little more proactive and finding these receipts and whatnot. It's not easy, very difficult. And, and uh, we don't know what's gonna happen with UPS. We have no idea. Uh, a caveat to that, um, another rheumatologist has sent us a similar problem, and this time the patient was working for PepsiCo. And so I emailed the CEO of PepsiCo and everyone on, in the C-suite implying that there may be a problem with the mandated white bagging. He put me in touch with his vice president of global benefits. So I had a Zoom meeting with the vice president of global benefits from PepsiCo and explained to them the problem with white, mandated white bagging and it might actually be costing PepsiCo more. And then I gave him the, exe uh, the example from UPS and he goes, well, that is a that's a big company. And I said, yes. And they had no idea they were paying over $30,000 a year more, and their patients were paying $500 a year more. I said, all we're asking, we're not asking to get rid of mandated white. We just want to find out, Express Scripts is your PBM. What are they going to charge for white bagging? And then you can compare it to what the physician will charge to buy and bill. And I said, CVS won't uh, give, excuse me, Express Scripts won't give us that information. And he said, well, we've been working for, with Express Scripts for, for many years now. And um, I'm not going to ask them to do that because we trust Express Scripts. He said, they have promised us lowest net cost on all of our drugs. And I said, what's, what's, what's their definition of lowest cost, net cost? And they said, he said, well, it's the lowest net cost. And I said, the definition of lowest net cost is in the mind of the person who's saying it. You have no idea what that means and where it comes from. So here is yet another large company that won't even ask their PBM what the price is. So that's two, national, right? UPS, PepsiCo. Are you guys ready for more names? Why should you read your plan document? And quite frankly, the question should be, why shouldn't you, or why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you read your plan document? Furlani Foods, I love their garlic bread. I do read plan documents for my patients. Every time that I have an access issue or I'm trying to understand a benefit, since I now know that it's not United Healthcare or Optum making these decisions, is the actual employer, I need to be able to understand this. So for my patient, we got a hold of the plan document. Uh, for Lani has United Healthcare and Optum RX for pharmacy benefit. What happened there? I almost died. This is exact language in that four Lani foods to this date on that plan document. So they can change the placement of a prescription drug. Changes can generally happen quarterly up to six times per year without any kind of prior notice to you. Can you imagine? You may be required to pay more or less. Imagine if that is you. Olympus and Palermo Pizza, another worldwide and local national company. Oh, Wendell, you're gonna love this one. Cigna. Cigna is keeping all rebates and other payments. They don't have to give any of that to the actual employer, even though, or the employee, even though they are being obtained on your behalf. Nothing to be passed on to any of you guys, even though you're the ones paying them big bucks, right? Nothing towards the co-payment, nothing towards the co-insurance. I'll leave Dr. Maria with that. Five minutes. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so we're going we're gonna to end with the conflicted consultant, and I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. Um, but I have to also give a shout out to Marshall Allen, who really um, sort of broke this open with ProPublica in 2019, talking about the large number of uh, benefits that the brokers get when they send uh, business their way. And also Michael Thompson and Paul Holmes, they did a webinar for the National Alliance of Healthcare Purchases, and uh, some of this has come from, from their talk. So, I mean, I think the numbers tell it. The more employees you have, the more money the broker gets with, for referral fees. And who's going to win in the fight for loyalty um, when they're making this much money? Um, Julie Selesnik ye um, yesterday talked about uh, Section 202 of the Con uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act and how it's supposed to granularly give you the information of how much your benefit consultant is making um, from the health plan, but that's been more and more difficult to get. And <clears throat> they sometimes, uh, the plans obviously disagree with the granularity of costs on the claims, and pharmacy benefit consultants, it's very difficult to get out from them exactly how much they're making, specific compensation. And sometimes it helps to have an attorney know how to word the question, so you're not just given it in aggregate. Okay, so what is it that they, that they don't do? They basically don't challenge the traditional PBM profit centers. Formulary construction, as I talked about. They don't inform the employer of the lower cost uh, medications, Biosimilars, I think biosimilars are getting a little bit more traction these days, but um, Paul Holmes told me the story of a large company that their broker said, oh, no, 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 you don't want to go to one of those biosimilar, Humira biosimilars, you're going to lose all your rebates. But they would have spent about $30 million less if they had gone to the USIMRI from Cost Plus Drugs. And then the whole idea of redefining drugs as specialty drugs, um, we didn't even go into the rebate aggregators. Two of the big three B PBMs have their aggregators where they collect all the rebates offshore. It's not, um, it's, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why you want to have your rebate aggregator in um, Switzerland. The inflection pro uh, inf inflation protection programs, they're, they're really hidden in there, and you really don't get much out of it. And they tend to pocket those price um, um, inflation rebates, and you saw how high those go. And finally, oftentimes they'll say PBM audits are not really um, necessary, and a lot of promises in the bids are mysteriously gone when you see the contract. So all of these things, employers end up paying 30 to 40% more. I'm trying to go faster. Um, so these are some things that you, know, you may want to consider when you're looking at um, brokers and demanding the actual cost of claims, obtain an ERISA attorney familiar with the PBM pharmacy shenanigans. The, the, the kinds of definitions and lack of transparency is ridiculous. Um, and ultimately, what you're going to need to do, and, and don't forget to read your plan documents because you are the author, is, I guess it's not supposed to come up. It's all about prudence. Remember, it's all about prudence. And this was definitely highlighted in the J&J &J case. And you can read the, the you know, the, the yellow highlighted for yourself, but Failure to use prudence in negotiating contract pricing terms. Failure to use prudence in the selection of PBMs. Failure to use prudence in prescription drug plan design. And I'll close with this cartoon. I think I'll close with the cartoon. Education and transparency are necessary. I picture this as a PBM board um, discussion. Let's never forget that the public's desire for transparency has to be balanced by our need for concealment. And with that, I'll close. Thank you very much for having us.